Good evening. Coming to you a little bit early like we've been doing because I've got to get this stuff up and running. And as soon as I get it up and running, we'll get into the message tonight. I'm not talking very loud at first. Uh, hallelujah. Okay, that one's working. And let's see. Okay, there we are. Hallelujah. Okay, waiting for it to go full screen. There we go. Now, start moving. <laughs> I'm frozen. Uh, okay. Good. Hey, man. Man, old high school friend. Hey, good to have you with us tonight. Boy, right on time. Hey, man. Let me see who else is here. Uh, we got we got others starting to tune in. I'd like to take a few minutes just before we get into the Word, talk about whatever the Lord gives me or whatever I feel impressed to share with you. Um because I want to give people a chance to tune in. Uh, we're live on Facebook on uh, my page. We're live on Periscope. We're live on Twitter. And then we will take the recording of this Bible study tonight and put it onto our YouTube page or channel. Uh, you can go to our, my YouTube, which is Pastor William Emmons, and uh, you can subscribe. Once you find my picture there, you'll know it's me. And subscribe and then you have access to all of our services and teachings um, we're starting to put upload some from last year so so far we should have all of this year up to this point good evening uh, Morgan and Kia good to have you with us so I just want to let you know I want to mention a couple of things I'm, I'm excited about uh, my wife and I had our uh, 48th year anniversary uh, Wednesday and uh, had a good time with celebrating and went out and had lunch and and uh, just had a good time uh, but she bought me a, a special gift which I think is so cool uh, this is called Rose book of Bible charts maps and timelines this is what it looks like uh, this actually was available through our local Ralph's grocery store they have a Christian uh, book display one of those uh, ones that spins around you can look at all different sides of it and this was on there and I showed her one day that I liked that and I wanted to get it and she got me that for our anniversary it's full of so many good things um, it, it's let me just uh, I found a page here that tells you what you need to know about where to get it how to get it uh, Rose Rose publishing come on um, uh, let's see see where to find that well it's just it says Rose publishing and but we got it through our local grocery store but uh, Hendrickson publishers Rose publishing www.hendricksonrose.com it starts out the first first thing it has is a chart which is and I'm not trying to sell this I'm just showing you is think if you're a student of the Bible like I am all these little things are really cool to have it's a chart of the uh, Bible timeline, uh, different events, when they happened, and so forth. Really cool. On the back is, and I'm not selling these, so I'm, <laughs> the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of charts like that in there, in here. A lot of other neat stuff. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, I'm going to try and find out where to get these wholesale and make them available in our bookstore. Uh, but anyway, a cool thing. So if you like that kind of stuff, uh, check your local bookstore. If they have a Christian uh, book display there, yeah, see if they can get it. If not, you uh, ask the manager of the store or um, talk to a local Christian bookstore. Uh, it's, uh, again, uh, Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines by uh, Rose Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. The second thing I want to show you, and, and Morgan, this is going to be your preview, uh, this is one of our courses from our School of Ministry correspondence course, and this is the Blood Covenant. This is the first one we teach in our School of Ministry, and when we have students uh, ordering them by correspondence, it's the first one we recommend because everything from the Bible, every, every dealing of God with man is based upon Blood Covenant. If you don't have an understanding of blood covenant, you're going to miss a lot of what the Bible tells us and why things happened the way they happened. And understanding the mind of God, understanding our relationship to him, 
uh, this course covers that. Uh, this has uh, uh, about 15 chapters. Um, it, it comes with all the notes. So uh, when you get in, so here's CDs that are the actual teachings from our School of Ministry. And we're gonna put them in a page actually where the page holds them in. Uh, and then we get into uh, the notes and uh, they, they come with all the notes and everything. Uh, you can go on our uh, Covenant Faith Center uh, webpage and you can order these or you can order directly uh, through me if you want if you want to order it just for your own Bible study purposes you're not looking for a diploma or a certificate from the School of Ministry uh, I believe the cost on that is $75 <clears throat> if you want to take it as a course and get credit for it toward an eventual uh, diploma from the Covenant Faith Center School of Ministry uh, then the cost goes up because we've got to test, include test and the final exam and, and you know all that goes with that issue certificate. Uh, it cost goes up to $100. So if you're interested in that, let us know. And uh, we, like I said, I wanted to show you that we've got this all set up and ready to go. Uh, waiting on some uh, CD holder pages that will allow us to put them in a page form, the CDs in a page format to hold um, I think it's six in on each page and you flip through those and you can go through the uh, chapter by chapter and study the CD read the notes and I'm telling you you're gonna learn so much about the Bible and why God did what he did said what he said why Abraham said the things he said and did what he did why David could kill Goliath and with a, a rock <laughs> you know but just a lot of neat stuff it brings you up to Jesus and and how Jesus could legally take our place and pay the price for our sins and you have to understand covenant to understand that otherwise you're just taking somebody's word for it all right so we're on everything is working and uh let's see who else is here um this used to just put everybody's name up oh we got a lot of people on it looks like um hallelujah good 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 all right well good to have you with us um last week oh, i want to read our our foundation scripture Joshua 1, uh, let's start at verse 8 this time. <clears throat> this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that's written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous. Then you shall deal wisely and have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong vigorous very courageous be not afraid neither be dismayed for the lord your god is with you wherever you go that's a covenant statement by a covenant keeping god that's why you need the blood covenant as your foundation all right so let's get into the teaching tonight <clears throat> last week we uh talked about a number of things and, and we do every every study we get into a lot of different things we're using this book as a jumping off point Two Kinds of Faith by E.W. Kenyon, and um, I'm, I'm waiting on an order for some of these. Uh, we're going to make those available when I get that order, but um, it, we, we really cover a lot of territory, and it's not just basic as you're learning by, by coming, tuning into the Bible study and listening. Last week, we talked about the principles of the doctrine of Christ. When Paul talks about we need milk instead of meat. Strong meat belongs to them that are exercised or mature in the things of God. And then he talks about leaving the basic doctrines uh, of Christ, not leaving them by turning away, but leaving like, okay, we got a hold of that. Now let's move on to advanced teaching. All right, so he goes on and explains what some of those are. And, um, and he used Hebrews chapter 6, a good place to look. He discusses love as an advanced teaching, even though Jesus talked about loving. Uh, he talked about serving one another. Jesus talked about that. Uh, he talked about diligence. Uh, boy, there's a lot of people today that are not diligent in studying the Word of God in prayer. And in fact, there's a lot of people that are not diligent much of anything. But he says we've got to become diligent. We've got to go after things. They're not just going to happen we got to use our faith and believe God and go after them. He talked about uh, following faithful examples, men and women 
that have gone on before us who the Bible says are inheriting the promises if they're getting results and they're inheriting the promises and their faith is working their prayers are working and you can see uh, the, the things uh, manifesting their lives that God promises then those are people you can listen to uh, I grew up in church and I got to be honest with you there's there's a lot of people I heard preaching growing up who it didn't seem like much was working for them except they're gonna go to heaven when they die praise God that's that's vitally important but other than that the Bible doesn't just give us an out uh, at the end we finally get to heaven everything's gonna be cool uh, the, but we live in a hell on earth that's not God's plan in fact God wants us to live in the kingdom while we're in the earth the kingdom of God the kingdom of God has no defeat and no failure in it uh, no poverty lack and want no sickness and disease no sorrow a and uh, so he wants us to learn how to walk above this natural world that we live in and walk in the things of God which bring us blessing bring us peace bring us uh, reconciliation and forgiveness and compassion and love and and victory in every situation um, you know those are the people that are experiencing that are ones that are inheriting the promise inheriting the promises I remember listening to preachers talk about you know well, God uh, you know gave me a, a, a great uh, blessing this week he gave me a tribulation and uh, you know I wrecked my car or my kid went in the hospital and was sick and I um, mean just you know terrible terrible things and blamed it on God and as we've already studied in this series God is not the author of those bad things he's not the author of killing stealing and destroying the devil is and we need to get that clear and quit blaming God for our problems so we need to follow preachers and teachers who are getting results who are walking in victory walking in healing or divine health even uh, walking in blessing walking in peace walking uh, uh, in a good marriage good relationships um, you know answers to prayer uh, I mean you know there there are things that clearly identify the Bible said you'll know them by their fruit so what kind of fruit are you following I want the fruit that the Bible teaches which is victory amen so he goes on and that was verse 12 of Hebrews 6 uh, verse uh, 13 and 14 talks about covenant blessings uh, verse 15 he talks about uh, patience plus endurance equals obtaining the promise uh, and patience constancy endurance which re re uh, means remaining firm under pressure without giving up or giving in so we're constant we remain firm we don't give up we don't quit hallelujah you don't quit believing God once you set your faith out there you pray and say amen you don't quit you don't quit believing you stand Paul said after having done all stand he didn't say how long he had to stand he said after you've done all you know how to do you know how to pray you know how to believe God you know what the word says you pray according to the word you give it to the Lord you say amen and then you go on he said after having done all that you know then stand why? Because there, there's going to be a fight of faith. Sunday I was talking about how the devil you know, comes against you. When the word is sown, Satan comes immediately to try and stop that word from producing fruit or results in your life. So there's going to be a fight. But the Bible says fight the good fight of faith. And so it's a good fight when you walk it out in faith. Not when you're moaning and groaning and complaining about why me and oh poor me. You know, that stuff doesn't work. So there in verses or verse 15 he, he mentioned now these are advanced teachings these are not your Sunday school teachings these are not things you usually get in many churches on a Sunday morning service the next thing he says uh, he talks about the faithfulness of God God being a covenant keeping God and that was verse um, 17 and 18 and then he talks about laying hold of hope hope is a confident and favorable expectation of good things to come see not bad things I, I, I have a confident, favorable, I'm, I have favor with God. Who do you have favor with? See, we're supposed to have favor with God. The Bible says we do, but too many times we don't recognize that we do, and we think God's mad at us. No, we find favor with God. All right, so he says, lay hold of the hope, the confident and favorable expectation. I expect good things to come. I expect blessings in my life. I expect favor with people. 
I expect the anointing to come on me when I preach and when I teach. I expect certain things because I have a covenant God who's a covenant-keeping God, and he's made promises which are really guarantees to us. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, Mary Smith, my cousin, good to have you with us tonight. Karina, good to have you with us tonight. Hallelujah. All right, so, and then that brought us to the subject of uh, the believing or believing with the heart. And um, when we believe with the heart, uh, we talked about the applying the measure of faith that God gave us. There's been dealt under every, unto every man the measure of faith, not a measure. I might have gotten one measure and you a different measure, but he didn't say that. He said the measure. He, he specified a single measure to every believer. And the measure I got and the measure you got are the same. What's the difference? What's the difference between me and you and somebody like Billy Graham or Oral Roberts or Kenneth Copeland or Jerry Savelle or these are people I know? Um, the difference is what you do with that faith. If you're in the, I'm in the place where God's called me, and, and uh, so I'm successful because I'm where God's called me to be, doing what God's called me to do. It's not based upon numbers or, or money or, you know, notoriety or recognition. It's based upon being obedient to God and, and filling my call, doing what he's called me to do, which only I can do. It's like a puzzle. We each have a different, we're each a different part of the picture. And so I have a part uh, that makes up the, is the part that, you know, my part helps make up the whole. You've got a part. We all have a part. But the faith level that we've got was all the same. And when the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith, his response was quite interesting. He said, if you had faith, you would say. If you had faith, you would say. They asked, increase our faith. He's telling them how to do it. He's saying, if you had faith, well, you, if you're born again, you got the measure of faith. So he said, you would say, and he said, say unto this mountain, be thou removed, cast into the honor place, doubt not in your heart, but believe that the things you say will come to pass. You will have whatsoever you say, right? So our words are, are the uh, mechanism by which we release our faith into our environment, our circumstance, our sphere of influence. I was talking about that Sunday, how the tithe builds a wall of God's protection around our sphere of influence or like a dome of protection over us. Our sphere of influence includes our immediate family, uh, my wife uh, and my kids, my grandkids. Of course, that extends out further as the family grows. We've got 10 grandkids now, praise God. Um, but uh, my sphere of influence includes our, our, fa our family finances. Uh, it includes uh, the health of my body, the health and healing of my wife. Uh, you know, just things like that are part of my sphere of influence. And we talked about how the, the tithe actually is what builds that wall of protection around us. And now you can break that down by sin and unbelief and disobedience to God and so forth. But when we're doing the things that the God's called us to do, because we're tithers, we've got that wall of, of protection around our sphere of influence and then when any and it talks about he can't steal the seed from your ground and the the vine won't cast the fruit uh, before its time uh but that indicates another thing taking place that within our sphere of influence there must be seeds sown there must be crops planted in other words we must use our faith and put it out there for what we need or want in life and believe god for and if we're not planting seed, we tend to not get crops. Because you know, you can't get a crop if you don't plant seeds. We talked about that Sunday. You ought to go back and listen to our Sunday morning service. And I got into that. I'm going to continue the teaching on uh, that this next Sunday. But uh, go back and study that. I'm not going to take time to do that now. All right. So the heart, as we talked about last week, is your spirit, man. Proverbs 4.23 says, To protect your spirit, with all diligence, for out of it, out of your spirit, flow the issues or forces of life. Matthew 12, 35. The good man from his inner good treasure, one translation says from his inner good deposits, brings forth into existence good things. Uh, 17, my cousin's telling me she got 17 grandkids. Uh, praise the Lord. Well, we're not done yet. 
and two great grandkids. Hallelujah. Well, we're getting there. We'll, we'll maybe catch up with you. <laughs> anyway, um, good man brings forth good things out of his deposit. What are you depositing in your spirit? Are you, are you focusing on the problems? Are you focusing on the news? Are you focusing on what the government says, what Congress says, what other nations say? Uh, I think it's, it's uh, amazing that people who are so ungodly can tell us as Christians how we ought to worship God and how we ought to compromise our faith because uh, of some policy they want to implement. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to believe God. But if we don't plant the word, and that's where I'm headed with this, if we don't plant the word in our spirit, man, we'll have no good deposits. Therefore, we can't bring forth uh, a harvest of good things. So he says a good man out of his, in good, uh, his inner good treasure or deposits bring forth, and uh, one translation says, flings forth into existence good things. Okay. An evil man out of his inner evil storehouse or deposits. People that are not serving God, living for God, they're not born again. They, they, they deposit evil thoughts and evil intentions. And they meditate upon evil things. And it brings forth a harvest of evil results, which is death, into their lives. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So they bring forth death, ultimately, into their life. Now... Last week we got to this point, and the comment I made was, you know, man, you and I are spiritual beings. We are created in the image of God. God is a spirit. He's not a body. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't have a spiritual body. We all have spiritual bodies. Uh, when we die, we're going to, you raise up out of the grave, we're going to recognize each other. You'll be in your spiritual body. I'll be in my spiritual body. We'll recognize each other. Of course, we'll look a whole lot better than we do right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we have a spiritual body, all right? The natural body is uh, kind of, if I can use the description of, when you go to the store and you buy something nowadays, there's a, a lot of them are, are sealed in plastic, uh, that vacuum sealed. You know, they suck the air out and that, that plastic seals right around. In fact, it's sometimes so frustrating to try and open up some of these packages because it is so strong and, and seals so well. But that, that's the seal that takes on the shape, the outline of whatever the object is inside. And, and what happens is our fleshly body, when God gave us a physical body at the moment of conception, uh, our physical body began to take shape. But that moment uh, of conception, that spark of life took place, and that set the cells in motion. And, and what happens is God forms a body for us around our spirit being. A baby is not a baby in spirit. A baby is only a baby in flesh. A baby is a spiritual being. And, and uh, in fact, there's a lot of teachings that, uh, that lead us to believe that uh, babies are more in touch with God than adults are. The only problem is because they're in a uh, um, immature flesh, they don't know how to communicate that wisdom. And the older they get, the further away from God sometimes people move. And they lose that, that uh, pure relationship with God. Well, there's a lot of theories about things like that. The important thing is, we are spiritual beings. We live in a fleshly body. Our body is conformed on the outside to our spirit man, which is on the inside. So again, if, if we saw each other in the spirit, we'd still see each other, but it wouldn't be fleshly. It would be a spirit. Now, a spirit being... A spiritual body, just like the physical body, needs food to function. So spiritual food, if we're a spirit being, spirit beings don't eat natural food like we do. You go out and get a hamburger or something. Spiritual beings need something to nourish the spirit man. We as spiritual beings don't get spiritual nourishment from a hamburger. <laughs> we get physical nourishment. We get spiritual nourishment from something that's spiritual Jesus talking to the Father said, Thy word is truth. And in another place, he said, the words, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. But it comes from the inside, not the outside. Amen? All right. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus replied uh, to the uh, disciples. 
He said, it is written, all right, this is not, I'm sorry, this is not the disciples here. This is when the devil was tempting. Hey, Josh. Hey, how are you? Oh, good. I'm glad to have you with us tonight. We're <laughs> just in the middle of this. Okay. So have a seat. We last kind of keep an eye on the cameras, if you would, there. Sure. I'm just getting my notes up. Okay. Uh, finally getting some help in here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. So Matthew 4, 4, Jesus replying to the devil when he was tempting him in the garden. And he said, um, he replied, it has been written, man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live and be upheld to stand by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth, proceedeth from the mouth of God. The devil wanted to offer him natural things, natural food. He was, oh, he, the Bible says he was a hungered, which means he was hungry. And so the devil wanted to offer him something uh, if he would worship him, if Jesus would worship the devil. And he said, man shall not live by bread, which is a physical food, but by every word which indicates that the Word of God is our spiritual food. And so we need to feed on the Word of God. All right? Let's read another verse. Uh, Job 23, 12. Job says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of God's lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So Job declares that he needed the Word of God. He needed to hear what God had to say more than he needed physical food for his physical body. Why? Because the Word of God is spirit and life. And we, and in order to be strong spiritually, we need spirit and life force coming into our spirit man to produce an outward physical life. Because out of the, remember, out of the spirit flow the forces of life. So that we want our spirit man to be strong because if our spirit man is strong, then our natural man can be strong. All right. John chapter 4, verse 32 he said unto them, I have meat, Jesus talking again. I have meat to eat that you know not of. He's, he's talking about food. They're talking about natural food. He's talking about something they didn't understand. They didn't know. Spiritual food. The word of God. Okay. John 5, 24 from the Amplified Translation. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, the person whose ears are open to my words, who listens to my message and believes and trusts, or is fully persuaded and clings to and relies on him who sent me has or possesses now eternal life and does not come into judgment, does not incur sentence of judgment, will not come under condemnation, but he has already passed out of death into life. What a statement. If you ever get a hold of that, it's going to make a difference in how you handle things and the way you think about life and and decisions that you have to make. You're born again. Being born again, we've passed from death to life. Legina, good to have you with us. Let's see, Torsha, good to have you with us tonight. We got quite a few people online uh, tonight. Wow, praise the Lord. Wow, that's a long list. Good to have you all with us. Stay with us to the end. Don't just watch five minutes and move on. I mean, we've got some meat here for you, and, and we're talking about uh, really spiritual food spiritual meat for spiritual people that's the subtitle of this message tonight all right so he's talking about the fact that we've already if if we the person whose ears are open to my words he's talking about the word again and, and he's talking about if we believe and trust in that we believe and trust in god he says we've already passed from death to life we don't have to worry about dying physically because the death that's most important is the spiritual death that we were born with, the nature of sin. It's passing from that spiritual death to spiritual life, which happens when you get born again. You make Jesus Lord of your life. And that comes by the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God, John chapter 1. And then if you go, if you go down to, I think it's verse um, 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Talking about Jesus. He's the living word so as we take the word we meditate upon it's like feeding uh it's like eating a meal i tell people in our congregation if you only come to church on sunday morning you're getting one warm or one hot meal a week uh you're not going to be very strong spiritually how would you survive if you only ate one hot meal a week uh not too well and, and I, that's why I, I constantly am encouraging trying to motivate people to get in the word for themselves uh, get, get, let's tune in Wednesday nights or get here and, and sit in on the Bible study 
and uh, get some, another hot meal, uh, you can do that. And, and so what, what that does is that feeds your spirit man. It strengthens your spirit man. And that's what we need to have happen. Amen? All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Now listen to this. This is a powerful, amplified translation. Therefore, we do not become discouraged, utterly spiritless, exhausted, and wearied out through fear. Though our outer man is progressively decaying and wasting away, yet our inner self is progressively renewed day after day. Now, he's not talking right there about how that happens. He just says, as a believer, he's assuming that we're going to be people of the Word, that we're going to feed on the Word of God. And so he, he's talking about what happens, all right? Verse 17, for our light, now listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul. If you remember the Apostle Paul, he was beaten, he was spit on, he was accused falsely. He, uh, I mean, just so many things. He was shipwrecked and went out, found, came on this island, uh, survived the shipwreck and ended up on an island. Uh, the natives there apparently were friendly. He went to gather some wood to build a fire. I guess they all needed to dry off and get warm. And there was a viper uh, in that pile of wood, and it bit him. And the natives were amazed that he didn't just drop over dead within seconds uh, because of the venom of that viper. And he shook it off and went about like nothing happened. That can only happen when the life of God in you is stronger than the death coming at us from the outside. You've got to have the Word in you in major fashion. You've got to be feeding on it daily to have that kind of faith to shake it off and move on. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Our light, now listen to what he says. Our light momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour, is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory, that everlasting weight of glory, the, the word glory there is doxa, D-O-X-A, and it's a manifestation of the nature and works of God in our lives. When we talk about, oh, the glory of the Lord manifested, that's God showing up on the scene, okay? But as a believer, the glory of God doesn't show up as a bright light, although I've seen things like that. It shows up as the supernatural power of God working in our lives, like with Paul when he shook off that venomous snake, all right? He says, since we can, oh, let's back up. The momentary light affliction, the slight distress of the passing hour, is ever more and more preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, a vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. All right, so he's talking about a, an experience of the manifestation of the, of the power of God, the, the glory, uh, of the nature of God, the works of God, God himself manifesting in our situation. I think we can all use some of that, amen? All right, verse 18. Since, now here's why he can call all the things he experienced light and momentary afflictions and, and, and preparing a, a heavy weight of glory, manifestation of God's presence. Since, now here's the reason, we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are visible. Now, what's visible? Well, your body's visible. Symptoms on your body are visible. What the doctor says falls into that sense realm. So in a sense, that's, that's visible. He can tell you. It, 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 what happens is the doctor tells you something and your mind it sees it, it becomes visible in your mind, but it will manifest out in the flesh. So he's talking about all the natural things, finances and relationships and jobs and careers and anything that you're involved with and driving down the street, that's all part of the visible realm. He said, so we don't consider and look to the things that are seen, but we look and consider the things that are unseen for the things that are visible are temporary. Why get all shook up over something that's temporary and could change in a moment? I mean, I don't care how bad the situation is. I don't care how bad you're, it is that you're dealing with. It's temporary. It is going to change. Now, it'll either change for the good or for the worse, depending on how you deal with it. I want every circumstance in my life to change for the good 
and to be delivered from the attack and not fall under the attack any further. Amen? So he said the reason why we don't consider and look at the things that are seen. We look at the things that are unseen. Well, the Word of God is a spiritual thing. Even though we got a Bible, that Bible is a book. But the Word doesn't become spiritual until it's on our lips and we begin to declare it. All right? We feed on the Word by meditating. The word meditating really does mean to speak, not so much to think. Although it, the Bible does say think on these things. But it talks more. In fact, it talks 75% more about saying what the Word says than it does about thinking what the Word says. That ought to tell you something. How, how important are our words? Amen? Hey, Jay Louvier, good to have you with us. Mary Pasolacqua, long time no see. Got some good uh, old timers. I, I'm sorry about that. Didn't mean to call you old. <laughs> we just know you from a long time ago. Praise God. All right, so we don't look at the things which are seen. We look at the Word, the spiritual side of the Word of God, which is unseen because we can't see into the spirit realm unless the gift of discerning of spirits goes into operation. Otherwise, we don't see into the spirit realm. But the Word is a spiritual thing. What is it? It's food for our spirit man. It's food to strengthen us and, and build us strong spiritually so that we can then fight the good fight of faith on the outside from the power of that's on the inside. Hallelujah. All right. Things that are invisible. The things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. The Word of God operating in us is invisible. It's deathless. It's everlasting. It's spirit. It's life. God's Word never changes. It, is, it doesn't say you're healed one day and God made you sick the next day. That's not in the Bible. It doesn't say God blessed you one day and then took away all your blessings the next day. That's not in the Bible. Now, there's people that try to accuse God of that. Even Job got caught up in that, trying to blame God for his problems when it wasn't God causing his problems. Amen? Can I hear you say amen out there? <laughs> All right. John 6, 63, <clears throat> Amplified Translation. It is the Spirit who gives life. He is the life giver. The flesh conveys no benefit whatever. There's no profit in the flesh. Now, this is where Jesus is talking. He says, the words, the truths that I have been speaking to you are spirit and life. So there you go. We feed the spiritual man by feeding on the word of God, which is spirit and life. You feed on natural food to give life to your natural body, but we have to feed on spiritual food to give life and strength and power to our spiritual body. Amen? The Word gives life in order to believe with the heart. Now, going back to the initial subject of tonight's message, uh, believing with the heart. In order to believe with the heart, we must give God's Word first place. And we must have God's Word on that subject. In other words, you've got to do some homework. Uh, whatever you're dealing with, whatever the challenges are in your life, you need to go back to the Bible, dig around in there until you find the scriptures where God has declared over you victory in that scenario that you're dealing with, whether it's financial or physical, relationships, uh, your, your careers, your, your business, your investment, whatever it might be. Find what God has to say about that. And once you know what God has to say about it, then you've got something to feed your faith for that battle that you're fighting. Now, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the way that you build your faith, you take that Word that is the answer to your situation, and you feed on it. You meditate upon it until the picture of what the Word promises you is bigger in your mind than the circumstance that you can see with your eyes. That's what Paul was saying here in 2 Corinthians 4. He said, we don't look and consider what we can see, because that's temporary. We look and consider something that we cannot see, which is the Word of God, because that's eternal. Is this making sense to you? All right, praise God. Let's see who else is with us tonight. All right, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good to have you with us. Um, praise God. Got a lot of neat folks with you. You're all neat folks. So. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, um, let's move on. And uh, I'm going to try and 
in the next few minutes. Uh, I've only got about, um, wow, 20 minutes left. Okay. How do we, let me backtrack a little bit here. Um, how do we bring ourselves to a place where we are believing with the heart? Okay. Number one, we got to spend time meditating the Word of God. Now, what happens when we meditate the Word of God? Well, the Bible says that the Word will renew our mind. The Bible tells us to have our minds renewed. Uh, and as we meditate upon the Word of God, that's exactly what happens. We quit thinking the way the world thinks, the way the flesh thinks, the way the economy thinks, and the way the news wants to tell us. We start thinking the way God thinks. Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest things we can do when we get into a situation is ask God to show us the way He's looking at it. Show us what He sees about it, because He sees things different than we do. And He'll give you a revelation insight that will amaze you. Like I said, that revelation that God gave me uh, a couple weeks ago uh, about how the tithe creates a wall of God's protection around your sphere of influence, your family, finances, health, and so forth. And, and it's how the giving you do beyond the tithe is a seed you plant in your field that can produce a harvest that the devil can't steal. When you are a tither, the next step to having protection and a financial blessing is the giving. Amen? That revelation, uh, that, that really set me free in, in a financial area I've been dealing with and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. But we've got to go back and meditate the Word until we begin to have our mind renewed. We begin to think the way the Word says, which is the way God thinks about it. We have to then begin to order our conversation. What that simply means is we don't just blurt out the first thing that comes to our minds. You know, you ever meet somebody that that's, has no filters? They just say whatever comes to their mind. You know, kids can be like that. Kids are very honest and, and, uh, and pure of heart, but they'll just say things that uh, with no filter on it, and you look at them and say, well, well, well you know, don't say it that way, you know. And uh, we, We've had six kids, and I know uh, raising them that... Uh, <laughs> It's challenging sometimes when kids just blurt things out because they don't have any filters to govern how they say things and what they say. As adults, we should have filters. And, and one of the things the Bible says, be slow to speak. Why did God say be slow to speak? Because most of us say the first thing that comes into our mind based upon what we see, feel, taste, touch, or smell, the senses. So we tend to respond based on sense evidence instead of on what God says. Remember, what's in the natural world is temporary. What comes from the spiritual world, the Word of God, which is spirit and life, is permanent. It never changes. All right? So we have to be slow to speak. And when we first, when uh, Mary and I first got a hold of this, there were days I just put my hand over my mouth. <laughs> I still do that sometimes. But what I, what I was doing was reminding myself, shut up, quit talking. You're not saying the right things. It's like Job got himself into trouble because he started talking the wrong things. And God finally speaks up to Job and he says, You've been, your words have been stout or strong against me. And Job questions him. He says, you know, what have I said? What have, how, how's that possible? And then God goes on and explains to him that he's been accusing God of being his problem when God wasn't his problem at all. And uh, I've got a book I wrote years ago on Job. I'm expanding it now. But in that book, I explained how Job got himself into problems. And, and the biggest part of it was the things he was saying. And that's how we get ourselves into problems. Most of the time, the problems we have are the result of the words we've been speaking. So we need to be slow to speak. Why? Because we need to take the time to find out what God said. Find out what the Word says. If we're still struggling, once we know what the Word says, if we're still struggling with our faith over that situation... And, you know, it's like one guy said, uh, you know, close your eyes and what comes to you right away? What do you see right away? Do you see the problem or do you see the answer? You know, when you close off everything else, try and close down the senses, what you're dealing with then, the way you believe about something starts showing up. So when you close your eyes, what do you see? When you first wake up in the morning, you're in a struggle or in a faith fight, what's the first thought you have? What's the last thought you have when you go to bed at night? Because they begin to be indicators to whether or not we're actually in faith. And so when you find you're still struggling with thoughts 
of unbelief and in uncertainty and, and, and anxiety and fear over the situation, and I guarantee you, you're not in faith. So what do we have to do? We have to be slow to speak. In other words, shut your mouth <laughs> and begin to think on and meditate what God said. Find the promise. Find the solution. Praise the Lord. Somebody wrote a note on here. I'm still looking, still looking, still looking. Jennifer Rosa, good to have you with us. Boy, a lot of people tonight. All right, so we order our conversation. That's what I meant by that statement, is we determine what we should say and what we should not say based on what the Word of God says. And so, you know, sometimes I'll sit down and write out a confession or a declaration of faith. Confession, somebody made it a dirty word a few years ago. It's all that confession stuff. I don't believe in that. Well, how about we make a declaration of our faith? I believe I am redeemed from the curse because God said so. Not because I feel it. It's not based upon my senses. It's based on what God said. Amen? The third thing we've got to do is we've got to learn to control our emotions. Quit letting our emotions control us. Quit letting the devil control us through our emotions. I'm sure we've all met people that, that have uh, quite uh, a range of emotional outbursts and um, uh, you know, tend to show their feelings all the time uh, and, and operate and make decisions emotionally instead of uh, by faith. And there's times I have to shut down my emotions. And now, it doesn't mean I don't have them, but I can't operate by them because they're fickle. Emotions will be the results many times of the experience you're having. And, and if you're having a bad experience, if you're under attack, and those emotions are going wild on you, you don't need to let them control you. So you have to take control. The Bible talks about the Word of God saving your soul. That's not the new birth. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's the developmental part of you. Your mind, will, and emotions have to be brought under the authority of the Word of God. Your mind controlled, renewed by the Word of God, so you think God thoughts. Your will being conformed to the will of God. Your emotions being controlled by the Word of God. And then the, the next part of that is your body, your flesh, has to be subdued and brought into uh, subjection to the Word of God. So all of it comes back to the Word of God. But we, we have to control our emotions. We have to conform our will to the Word of God. And we have to order our actions, just like we had to order a conversation. We have to order our actions. That means we got to determine what we're going to do and what we're going to say. If you're under attack physically and you're claiming your healing, do you act like you're sick? We say, well, you know, Pastor, I am sick. Yeah, I got symptoms. I got this. I got that. Well, I remember a couple weeks, no, maybe three or four weeks now, uh, I woke up one Sunday morning and uh, I opened my eyes. I felt great, but when I opened my eyes, the room went, shoo, started spinning. I closed my eyes really quick. I thought, well, that's just a fluke, you know. I opened my eyes again, my eyes again and it, was, it moved again. And I did that half a dozen different times. And every time I opened my eyes, the room was just going like that, you know. And uh, I, I, laid, I just laid there for a minute before I got out of bed. And I said, no, you know, I'm redeemed from the curse. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. And since I'm healed, I'm going to get up and act like I'm healed. I got out of bed. I went in and took a shower. It didn't stop immediately, but it did stop. By the time I got dressed to come to church, there was no spinning. There was no nothing going on. Uh, that healing manifested in my body. If you believe what the Word says, then you've got to begin to act like what the Word says is true. Otherwise, if, if you're not willing to act like what the Word says is true, then you really don't believe it. You, you mentally assent to it. You say, well, you know, that's yeah, that's good. I, I, I believe God said that. But you've never made it personal like God said it to you. And that's what we need to do. Amen? So, we, let's go back over those five things. Okay, the first thing is you got to renew your mind to the Word of God. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your soul. Remember the soul, mind, will, emotions. Okay, all right. So the Word is able to save your soul. We've got to order our conversation. We've got to declare what God says over our situation rather than what the situation is saying to us. We've got to control our emotions. Don't let the emotions control us. We've got to conform our will. Change your will. How do you do that? By spending time meditating the Word of God until 
the, what God has declared for you is bigger than what anything outside of uh, God's word can, can promise you. Just like Jesus in the garden, the devil promised him certain a bunch of stuff and, and he didn't fall for that. He's, he, in fact, you see the temptation there. <clears throat> he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. He, he was saying, you know what? I know what's coming. I, in the natural, I'm not looking forward to this. But what did he do? He conformed his will to the will of God. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He conformed his will to the, to the word of God, the will of God. See, the word of God and the will of God are one and the same. If you can find the word on it, you know God's will on it. Well, I don't know if God wants me to prosper. Then you don't know what the word says about it. Because the Bible says God wants to give you a life of prospering. Hallelujah. And that's even part of our redemption. Prosperity is concluded in that. All right. So we conform our will to what the word says. And then the fifth thing was to order our actions. Get up and act like you're healed. If you believe you're healed, then act like it. If you believe God's going to supernaturally supply your needs, then quit worrying about money. Well, i got to earn a living. Nobody said you didn't have to earn a living. Why don't you believe God for a raise? Why don't you believe God for a bonus? Why don't you believe God for a better job? And, you know, <laughs> sow some seed. We talked about that Sunday. Sow a seed for a better job. If you don't like the job you've got, pray and ask the Lord, Lord, what kind of seed can I sow? I can't have a harvest if I don't sow a seed. I need a better job, so I want to sow a seed for that better job. And you determine how big a seed you should sow, and then you sow it into soil, spiritual soil, that's producing good results. Okay, hopefully our ministry is doing that, so you're welcome to sow seed here. I believe we are. Uh, or your local church, if you've got a pastor preaching the word, and, you, and your pastor's uh, teaching you how to walk in victory, you can sow your seed there. But the Bible teaches us to follow those who through faith and patience are inheriting the promises. They're getting the results we want to get. And if your pastor or your church doesn't teach that, I question whether or not that's a good seed or a good soil, I mean. And I'm not trying to get anybody, any other pastor mad at me. If they'd preach the word, there'd be no problem. We all need to go back to the word. Amen? All right. So, we need to learn to accept the testimony of people that have gone on before us and gotten results. People that have walked in victory. That's why we've got a, a, a bookstore here full of books. Now, I call them books of faith. Well, any book that strengthens your faith is a book of faith, even though the subject may not be faith. we got books on healing. Uh, we got a great book. i uh, got to think about where I put it. Oh, right here. All, well, this one on the supernatural, All Things Are Possible. Uh, great book. we got uh, oh up, up here, Christ the Healer. Um, uh, boy, I'll tell you, we got, we got two whole rows of books on nothing but healing. Uh, we got books on finance. We got books on relationships. We got books on dealing with children. Um, that's why I sit in front of our bookstore here. I want you to see all these titles and understand there's some good teaching out there. Well, if we're going to plant good seed for a good harvest, we need to make sure we plant it in good soil. That's why I said Sunday we talked about that. And we talked about how to plant seed. And actually, some people did plant seed. We planted some seed for some things we're believing God for. And, and that's within our sphere of influence. That's our, our, our um, fields where our harvest will grow uh, is the seeds we sow. And, and again, that tithe protects, the devil, protects us from the devil's attacks trying to destroy our seed. Amen. All right, go back and listen to my message from Sunday. Um, we accept the testimonies from those that have experienced it and gotten results. We got about six and a half minutes left. Um, we act on the Word of God in faith. When we think about, and I, I've already said this, when we think about what you're believing, close your eyes. What do you see? If you don't see the answer, if you don't see what God has declared over you for that situation, and all you see is the problem, then you're not yet in faith. So you need to go back and spend more time meditating the Word of God. Uh, if you still have anxiety and concern about it, you still not have faith. Go back and do the same five things again. Renew the mind. Order your conversation. Control your emotions. Conform your will. Order your actions. Amen. All right. And I want you to get, get, get this principle here. It's not, if I can say it this way, it's not what you do that determines the results. It's what you believe. See, Pastor, you just told us we got five things we got to do. But you got to understand what I'm saying here. 
You don't get results because you confess 5,000 times you're healed. You get results for healing because you believe you're healed. Because God said you're healed. Jesus bore your infirmities, your sickness, your diseases upon his own body. By a stripes ye were healed. Once you come to a point that you believe that, then you'll receive your healing. When you believe the word that says, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. When you believe that, and then you go out and you give to the poor, you give your tithe, you sow your seed of offerings, you do that because you believe God's taking care of you, and you can plant seed in faith, knowing that God will make sure that harvest comes to pass in your life. Hallelujah. But you don't, you don't think because I did something, okay, I did the five things pastor said to do, now where's my miracle? Uh, you, you're going to have to take some time. This isn't an overnight get-rich-quick scheme. This is a lifestyle. you got to take time to meditate the Word of God and renew the mind. You got to take time to feed on the Word of God to build spiritual strength, what we would call today faith. Plant in our spirit man the deposits that will bring forth good fruit instead of continuing to listen to the garbage that's out there telling us we can't make it, it ain't going to work for us, and, and you know, it goes on. Amen? All right. So, becoming fully persuaded, that's, that's really where we're heading with all this teaching is that I'm trying to help you to become fully persuaded like Abraham was when he was about ready to sacrifice Isaac and he makes a statement that, that I, he leaves the servants at the base of the hill or the mountain there and he says, I and the boy shall return. He was talking faith. We're going up to perform a sacrifice. He already knew what God told him. So he, he's speaking out faith. The servants don't know what's going on. They would expect him and the boy to return. He gets up there and... and uh, you know, Isaac says, uh, Dad, I see the wood for the sacrifice. Um, I see the altar we've just built. But uh, where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? And, and Abraham, uh, uh, he, he makes a statement. He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. You could take that a couple of ways. First of all, God will provide the sacrifice to worship God, right? But it says he will provide himself a sacrifice. God sent Jesus himself a sacrifice for our sins. But he laid Isaac on the altar, and he prepared to sacrifice him because nothing else had happened. And, and the Bible says, looking back on Abraham's actions, he believed so strongly that God would, if necessary, raise Isaac up from the ashes of that sacrificial fire. That's being fully persuaded. He had full confidence in God. And Job, you know, he made that statement uh, famous, you know, uh, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job had lost everything, and he's still saying, I trust God. It doesn't matter what it looks like. I may have messed up, and sometimes we got to repent, confess, I miss God, and confess and get that sin out of our lives, and, and then go to God and say, God, what do I need to do? And Job said, even if he were to kill me, I trust God no matter what. And Job ended up getting back double what he had lost. He was fully persuaded. David, you know, when he hears about Goliath, and he's, and they're telling about this giant out there, this offspring of the Nephilim from Genesis chapter 6, this guy was a giant in, in every sense of the word, raised to be a warrior from childhood. And he's, he's a mercenary. He's working for the, the Philistines there. And um, he, he said, what did, what did Goliath say? And, and they repeat what Goliath was saying. He's, he's putting down the God of Israel, putting down the Israelis and everything. And, and David runs out there. And, I mean, David, you know, he, he was not very old and, you know, very young man. And he's got a, 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 a staff in one hand. And he's got a slingshot in the other hand. And he, on his way out there, he runs over a creek and he picks up five smooth stones, puts them in his pouch. That was ammunition. And he runs up to Goliath and he <laughs> said, You have defiled the armies of the God of Israel. Wait a minute. If I defiled God's armies, then I defile God. But Goliath didn't get that. And Goliath ridiculed David and he said, You come to me with a stick? I mean, he, you know, it's kind of like 
God was saying, look at this. Look, uh, look over here. See what, see what this is? It's a stick, you know. What he didn't see was the stones and the sling that David had. I read a study that they did, and they found out that the power of a slingshot is the power of a 45 caliber pistol being fired. And at the close range David was to Goliath, it was like Goliath being shot in the forehead with a 45 caliber pistol. They, they, that centrifugal force, when they release that stone, is going that fast. And the Bible says it sunk into his skull. It didn't just bounce off. It killed him. And Goliath, and Goliath was threatening David. David was, was uh, fully persuaded. He served the God of Israel. He served a covenant God. And he went out there in faith with all the odds against him. Everybody else, all the great warriors, were afraid to go fight Goliath. And he runs out there, and he takes a stone. He slings that stone and lets it go. And, and he kills the, the, the one warrior that everybody's afraid of. He kills him and cuts his head off and holds it up. And you know, basically, that was the end of that war. All right. And then, of course, Jesus being fully persuaded that even though he had to go through the sacrifice that he was going to go through, fully persuaded that God would raise him up from death and, and keep the promise God had given to Jesus. He would raise him up. The Spirit of God, the Holy, the Holy Spirit would go into that place and raise him up, bring him out of hell that he'd been in for three days and seat him at the Father's right hand and that his blood and his sacrifice would be sufficient to not just cover our sins like Passover did, but to eliminate them, to wipe them out. Jesus was fully persuaded, just like them. And I can go on and list you, read Hebrews chapter 11. You see a whole long list of great people of faith that were fully persuaded. What I'm trying to do is to bring you to a place of being fully persuaded and to be able to believe God for victory in every situation, not win some, lose some. You understand that? That's not the way of, of victory. We win every time. Amen? All right, well, I'm out of time. I've gone a minute and 46 seconds over. Listen, some of you I know God's been dealing with about partnering with us. We've had some that have begun to partner with us. If you want to partner with us, we, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we pray for our partners daily. We believe every time we receive a partner offering, we pray over that uh, for our partners, for their harvest. And if you want to be a part of that and sow seed into this ministry, uh, a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, you can send a check, P.O. Box 4238, that's West Hills. California, zip code 91308, make it out to CFC. If you got PayPal, you can use uh, PayPal. Our email there is wemmons01 at gmail.com. Use the friends and family option so they don't take out any fees, and you can do partner giving that way. Uh, partners that we're believing for, we're believing for 100 partners to, to get behind us and, and become partners with us as we preach the gospel all around the world through the means that we're using right now. And, and you be a partner with us, and we'll partner with you and believe God and pray for you. All right, we love you guys. We'll see you next week. I know I went over, but hey, it's worth it. Amen? All right, we're going to shut this down now. You can go ahead and stop, the, that, stop that one.